The Storm Trisel Foundation is a charitable organization dedicated to supporting the education of young sailors, the safe and knowledgeable transitioning for young adult sailors from dinghy to big boat racing through intercollegiate competition, safe boat handling in all conditions, and competent blue water racing and passage making. The foundation supports a national program of events, including junior safety at sea seminars, hands-on safety at sea seminars for adults and juniors alike, regattas, and other specialized on the water training. The foundation makes grants to other institutions to foster similar education and training. As part of its educational mission, the Storm Trisel Foundation has sponsored a series of topical videos to promote safety at sea and continues to update and expand the series. This video is part of that series and is designed to encourage and inspire more women to spend time blue water racing and passage making. We hope you'll watch this video and the others in this series, learn from them, and it'll make your sailing a lot safer and more fun. One of the great joys in sailing is racing offshore. The freedom you feel and the constantly changing beauty of the sea are magnificent backdrops in a competitive environment. The camaraderie of a crew who experiences life at sea together is always special. All sailors appreciate the weather, the water, the scenery, sea life, and the infinite mosaic of images that make sailing long distances invigorating. Regardless of how your boat might place in a race, the experience always provides extraordinary rewards. And because offshore sailing is so special, all of us who are lucky to race offshore should encourage more sailors to join the fun. Unfortunately, the number of women who race offshore is disappointingly low. The Storm Trisel Foundation has been working on an initiative to encourage more women to participate in long distance racing. The thoughts of 10 highly experienced sailors explain helpful ways to get more women on the water. Crossing the Atlantic Ocean is, is really, it's, a, it's wonderful, it's singular. Um, it's, it's simple in that it, uh, your world shrinks down to the size of the boat. The adventure, the disconnecting with land and just focusing on either racing or cruising and the camaraderie. I do uh, more offshore racing than inshore. Uh, more of my racing is on bigger boats, uh, most recently Trip 41s or J boats. All that you need to worry about is the boat, who's on the boat with you, and just, you know, getting to where you need to go. The wonderful feeling you get when you're off in the middle of nowhere with just the stars and the wind and the water and relying on the people who are on the boat with you and uh, relying on yourself. It's kind of freedom. You get to do your own kind of thing. You know, it's all, it's all about feel. And when you're in the pit or you're trimming a sail, you have the feel of the sail, uh, but only the one that you're working on. And when you're driving, you get to really feel the mechanics and the physics of it all when it comes together. Your world is from horizon to horizon. Um, and you get into this rhythm of going on watch and off watch, and, uh, and then it repeats. I think it's really important to feel that you can um, enjoy it on your own. Sail a laser or a sunfish or whatever as, as much as you can, just so that you know that you can enjoy being on the water. And then from that, I think it uh, expands into offshore sailing so that uh, you can have the confidence to stand on the dock and ask for a place on a boat um, just because you want to be on the water. I, I love the racing part of it uh, because you're, you're, you've got to keep going and you want to go as fast as you can and you want to be as perfect as you can. But the cruising aspect is nice, but it's laid back. and. We cruise, we cruise our boat um, every year for two weeks. 
you know, we'll go out to block. And instead of sailing, because we want to get there, if we can't go five knots, we put the motor on. That's terrible. We're not sailing. We might as well have a motorboat. <laughs> Deciding you want to sail offshore is one thing, but finding a boat to sail on and gaining acceptance and confidence from its crew is the next step. Honestly, I was a little scared in the beginning, <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> I was asked to do a return trip from Bermuda, which I think is the best way, you know, for anybody coming into the sport and to see how they, you know, if they have legs to get out there offshore is to do a return trip. Put your hand up and, or if you are bashful, go find somebody who's doing it on the crew. Go ask a guy, can I go out and start with maybe a J70? That way now you're four people on a boat or you're five people on a boat. Just before I graduated from college, I asked my father if he knew anybody sailing transatlantic and he gave me the name of a fellow from Salonica who was getting his boat over to England for a cow's week and fasten it. And uh, I, persuaded him to take me along as cook. And the way you get that opportunity is, you know, somewhat marketing yourself, taking these safety at seas, you know, certifying yourself, but just getting out there and going sailing with people, asking if you need crew. You can go in and even put your name up on a crew board because big boats are always looking for someone to race. And if you can be consistent and commit, then you're gonna be a really valuable crew member. If you're coming into it after college, uh, probably the best thing to do is to go to a club that has PHRF racing. And this is where you just start cutting your chops on knowing the positions on the boat and getting yourself up to speed on it. And then you get to know more of the people through the social parts of it, and then you move on. Everybody's always looking for good crew, and college sailors make great offshore sailors. They already have the basics down, and they just have to uh, learn to respect the power of uh, loads on a bigger boat and how to, how to wrap wrap a line around the winch the right way. If they sail with us, I try and, you know, I would encourage them to come with us. We do have some women crew that come occasionally on, you know, for Can One on Wednesday nights or on weekend races. And it's a little intimidating, but you got to take the first step and go. Get some education in the field, you know, whether it's small boat racing, club racing, whatever it is. I would also encourage women and men alike as I was advised to develop a, a racing resume, a sailing resume, to show what you've done. You bring more than a sailing ability to a big boat. It's, it's a sense of the weather. It's a sense of what the other boats are doing. It's uh, being able to fix things uh, that break. It's uh, watching the crew and making sure that somebody isn't pushing themselves too much or maybe ill so that you are managing people as much as managing a boat. And the best sailors I know do that instinctively. I grew up with four brothers, so they really treated me well. So for me, being on the boat with all boys was not a situation. I also have sailed with amazing, amazing guys who just treat me like the crew, and that's nothing else. They actually don't even say, oh, we have a female on board. It's just we, Martha's on board and she's part of the crew. On the race sites, there's always somebody, you know, looking for crew. You know, I, I've, I've looked for crew there too, and you'd sit there, I don't know that person, so that makes it more difficult. But the more you can say about yourself and the more that you can, uh, you know, show people what you've done, that's the biggest thing. You've got to get the experience, but you've got to get out there to get that experience. The last frontier, in my opinion, for women in sailing is women in decision-making roles. Not just leadership. Leadership without power is not decision-making. So women in leadership with decision-making powers is where we need to go. But until we have that, when you're trying to prove yourself, you still have to double-prove. You still have to organize in front. And then once you're on the boat and actually sailing and doing your job, it, you're accepted. Sailing is more about the people than the sails. It's about being on a boat with people you want to be with. A successful offshore experience is dependent upon feeling safe on board and having confidence in your crew, your skipper, and yourself. I was brought up in the old school of how to learn to sail offshore which was you got yourself on a boat with people who knew a lot, 
and you try to absorb as much as you could from them. You always want to make sure that you know who you're sailing with and that you can trust them, and that is truly a big thing. We normally do like three hours on, three hours off. Um, now that we're cruising, we do three on, three off pretty much at night, but we're a lot more um, relaxed about it. If somebody um, is tired, they get the other person up. If somebody else is, uh, feels like they can sail longer, they keep going. I've always taken the safety at sea courses. I've always been certified. So you want to make sure that, you know, you're prepared that way safety-wise. You want to check your gear. That's always very important. A lot of what, it, what about sailing uh, long distances is it's the preparation. It's before you go. And if you have everything in order before you go, then you can just uh, relax and enjoy the passage. Safety harness everything. As a matter of fact, I wear, um, when I'm going forward, I'll wear double if I'm wearing my chair for climbing, but I always have my safety harness and my inflatable on. Safety gear really breaks down into two areas. One is what you use all the time for preventative purposes, and then what you have for emergency response. Uh, with emergency response, you don't want to be figuring that out as the emergency is turning into a crisis. Uh, that's one of the things that Safety at Sea seminars have really changed people's minds, that the more you have this in hand before you leave, the better you'll, off you'll be if something starts going south. To prepare for offshore racing, it's the same as anybody would do, is I try to get as enough sleep, I try to make sure I'm hydrated, I try not to be queasy or have a cold and be as healthy as possible. And then the one thing I do different is I do visualize what the race is going to be like, how long it's going to be, so what kind of conditions we might see. I have personally have taken some courses after power boating. I learned marine engines. I learned marine electrical systems. I mean, I might be the one responsible for fixing something. You know, navigation again. Uh, but get educated, you know, learning. It's lifetime. And uh, no one can take that away from you. Figuring out what to take with you offshore is a careful balancing act. Packing the right mix of clothing will keep you more comfortable and effective as a crew member, but packing too much won't keep you in the skipper's good graces for very long. Staying comfortable for me is staying warm and dry. That's the first thing. So as long as I have my proper clothing, because once I get cold, I'm not really good for anything. I always try to have one set of clean, dry, under layer like socks, hat, gloves, and long underwear, depending on you know, what the weather is, in a Ziploc bag, and that's in the bottom of my sea bag. I make sure that I have a knife, I have my safety harness, I safety harness that's fit and labeled, and I keep that with me even when I sleep. When it starts to get cold, I need my neck gaiter, I need my hat, and I probably need a heavy wool pair of socks. There's a pretty good weather window out to about five days. You can pretty much tell what your climate's going to be and what your water temperature is going to be, and that, that tells you how heavy the clothing is you have to go with. A headlamp with a red LED light so you don't give everybody else night blindness. Leather girl, watch, <laughs> um, hat, sunscreen. We have a, a very strict uh, weight allowance of what you're allowed to bring on the boat. When we go on a race, we sometimes we get on a scale and make people put their bag on the scale. <laughs> and if, you, if your bag weighs too much, you have to take stuff out of it. Protect your toes. Bare feet do not belong on the deck of a boat, in particular when you're racing. You know, you learn from the around the world sailors that they only need one pair of uh, long underwear, and I tend to take more than one just because I don't like to be stinky. <laughs> I usually have a piece of gum because I know coming off watch, if I can't brush my teeth, I want a piece of gum in my uh, bellwether gear pocket just because I don't want to have that bad breath when you're talking to your crewmate. <laughs> The path to a successful offshore passage winds around teamwork, focus, and leadership, all traits that will be well served by any person sailing offshore. I'm lucky because I've essentially seen an all-male crew when I was the only one, an all-women's team, and I've been on mixed teams. I love the mixed teams. The dynamic is different, 
but it's because it's a more complete team. You've got enough different perspectives that you have a better decision-making capability. Find a crew that you feel comfortable with. Find a captain that you feel comfortable with. Know the boat. Know the boat inside and out. Know how the head works, know how the gear works, know where the emergency equipment is. I make sure that my attitude is very optimistic, that I really, I go in there, I don't have anything to prove. I want to learn from everybody around me. When you're on the boat, everyone's an equal. No one sees, oh, I'm older, so I have more authority. It's almost like we all respect each other's opinions and we all respect each other's experience. So no matter what gender, age, whatever, we all acted the same and talked through every decision. So much of it is attitude and your willingness to learn and to do everything. And don't be afraid to say, I'm not sure exactly how you want this done. I've seen some various sizes of men and women absolutely excel on a boat because they pick the right job for what they're, what they're suited for. Maybe they are going to be the best helmsman in heavy air, even though they weigh, you know, 100 pounds soaking wet and they could be the best navigator because they don't get seasick and they can sit down at the nav table in challenging conditions. Scientifically, the same, f a male, female, same weight, same body fat. In other words, you have to work out, you're the same strength. There are no physiological differences. Technically, statistically, women are 40% less strong in the upper body, 10% in the lower body, but a large percentage of that is because they haven't been conditioning. You know, in offshore sailing, people tend to focus on, oh, the heavy weather stuff, how are you gonna surf down this wave and not wipe out and all of that. Most of the racing we do uh, needs a very light touch and needs uh, uh, that concentration you were talking about. Uh, for, for long periods of time. Most women are very good at concentration uh, and continuing to trim and long hours, spinnaker trimming, you know, for three, four hours at a time. I, ideally, nobody does anything for more than an hour, but you can. I was a little nervous, but we went out there with a plan. Our plan was to go as far as we can. And if it turned out that we went as far as we could, we hit a storm, broke something, or didn't feel comfortable, we can always turn around. And sometimes, frankly, if we're gonna go generalization, we call it at Oak Cliff using your boy eyes. Hey, it's clean. Using your girl eyes, it's a disaster. So you gotta work through that. Finding where you fit in among the crew is an important step to becoming a part of the boat's team. It's easy to get labeled as the galley slave, but having a specific skill to rely on will help pave your way forward. If you start looking at people for all of their qualities, not just can they, how fast can they put a jib up? Because most of the guys in the cockpit can't put the jib up that fast anyway. Then you're now balancing your crew for ability and experience. Uh, I usually do pit or I drive. So um, if I do pit, I'll balance back and forth trimming. That's where I started out on the Young American team. Um, I started out when I was 12 or 13 trimming for Peter Becker uh, on a J105, and then I graduated to pit, and now I'm doing more driving. Usually the new guy is on the four guy, and then they graduate to trimming the jib and maybe the mainsail or tactician. So it takes a while if you're, if you're brand new to sailing and you get involved in a big boat to kind of work your way around the boat. In fact, I'm not the cook on our boat. I will help, I don't know, maybe because I feel I should, but I think that's just me anyway. But. Um, yeah, there, I'm sure that there are stereotypes, but it shouldn't be that way. How do you get away from women just being shoved in the galley? Uh, the hard part is, is like, I love to cook, but on a race boat, that's not my job. I'm there to do something else, so I have to say it up front. I'm here as the boat captain, or I'm here as the pit person. You need to have a little sharp elbows, and if all else fails, you need to tell other people to go get the coffee. If somebody's never been an engineer, they should be an engineer, and we help coach them what they need to do to do an engine check, um, check the coolant, check the Raycor, make sure the through hole's open before you start the engine, kind of walk them through if any problems arise, and sometimes we push the females to be in that role rather than in the galley. Being small can be a great advantage because sometimes something breaks or goes wrong down below and I can just sort of climb into those really small places and fix things. Navigation is what I tell all small people they should be doing. 
because a small, a small smart navigator is a huge asset. The equipment out there is amazing. And a lot of the guys that are, I won't even say guys, but a lot of the people that are currently sailing now, that technology is still so, so new to them that they don't even know it. I work out probably five days a week since I've been 15. And I lift weights and I do, the good news is I've been doing it for 40 some years, so I do what I feel like that day. Some days it's weights, some days it's aerobics, some days it's a walk on the beach picking up plastic, I'm, but I'm always moving every day. We need to get more women on big boats where they don't feel they have the strength. You don't need the strength, you can use agility. I love to helm, so luckily I, I get to helm a lot and I, I totally enjoy that. And I just have this, I don't know, maybe it's a female thing, who knows, but I can concentrate a heck of a lot better than the guys on my crew, especially in light air. I have seen an awful lot of really good helmsmen, women helmsmen. Um, maybe it's because they, that is their job right then, is to, to steer. And, they, and maybe they don't consider themselves the skipper just because they're holding on to the wheel. So now they're gonna steer the boat. They're not trying to figure out sail trim at the same time and they're not trying to maneuver people around the boat. Sailing offshore brings a host of special challenges. The boat is your dormitory shared with everyone else aboard. So privacy is fleeting and healthy habits are hard to come by. And then there's seasickness. I have gotten seasick. I tend to not get seasick. Um, I sail with guys and I kind of tend to be the mother hen and so I have to overcome that and, <laughs> and take care of them. So I've, I've pulled out buckets of stuff <laughs> and you know, just that alone can make you wanna whatever, but you just do it. The one medication I do think is, is good, is, which now is over the counter, is bonding, chewable tablets, it's meclizine, but that form tends to be a little bit less sedating. Again, try anything onshore before you take off. And when it gets really rough, I have been known to get seasick, and that's in the Gulf Stream when I'm really tired. But otherwise, then I can sleep it off, come out of it, and uh, really be, be comfortable there. Leaving uh, California, it was very rough, and pretty much the whole crew was seasick, so there were two of us that were kind of handling it, which it was fine. It was just a heavier reach, so there was nothing to do other than drive and check in for roll call. I have hair. I have a lot of hair. I've always had a lot of hair. And my husband hates when, he doesn't want me to brush my hair in the boat because it's all in the, in the scuppers and everything. But, um, you know, that's another thing. You, before you go on a race, I braid my hair. I stick it up in a, in a hat. I always have a hat on or something like that or wrap it all up. Hand washing is important, uh, especially if you're working in the galley. I mean, especially anywhere. But the Purell stuff, which I don't personally believe in day to day, I think on a boat that's acceptable. But if you're working in the galley, hand washing, if you have someone on board that's ill, in particular with a GI bug, which seems to wreak havoc in Key West, uh, hand washing is of utmost importance, and in particular if you're handling the food. Clothing that can keep you dry, keep you cool, keep you warm, <laughs> um, in layers that dries quickly, because once things get salty, you never get the water out of them again. If you're taking medications that, for example, are opiates, narcotics, or sedatives, uh, what else? Um, antihistamines, motion sickness medications, they can all be sedating or all have adverse effects. You need to know about that before you go offshore. If you're trying a new medication, such as a scopolamine patch, which may be wonderful for seasickness, it can cause blurred vision. It can cause hallucinations and other psychiatric issues. Ch check out your medications before you go offshore. i just gotten on a boat with an owner I didn't know. And uh, you know, it was warming up during the middle of the day, so I, I was talking to him, I guess I was navigating. So I was talking to, to him about what we might have in mind for plans. And then I, I realized that I was very casually changing out of my pants into a pair of shorts without, uh, without really thinking about it. You don't have a lot of amenities, no hot shower 90% of the time, unless you're in a really nice boat. Uh, you, you eat the same food as everybody else. Um, 
Sometimes it's freeze-dried food like you would camping if you're into other sports, uh, no matter what your sport is, whether it's triathlon or running or cycling or anything else, you're used to uh, kind of a minimal lifestyle. You know, there's always issues about using the bucket. What do you want to do? Are you comfortable? But when I go offshore, there's a head, so that's a bonus for me because I'm used to sailing dinghies, inglings, and everything, and there is no head on board. So we're all used to peeing in the bucket. And if we're gonna talk about like going to the bathroom, women sit down all the time. Guys have to make a big announcement when they're gonna sit down. If you expect that you need real privacy, then you talk that out, saying, you know, guys, I'm not comfortable with this, and then they'll understand it. Or you come through and say, I'm just one of the guys, so I'm totally fine. Uh, some of the wives who weren't on the boat would be worried about having you know, a young girl on board the boat. Well, I can guarantee you when you're salty, sweaty, gross, nobody's thinking that way. Uh, but for privacy, it's really simple. You wear a two-piece bathing suit if you're really worried about it, or you wear you know, cotton underwear and you turn your back and you change. It's no big deal. It seems like the dam has burst here over the last uh, five, eight years in, uh, in the sport for women. And we've got some incredibly uh, talented women that, that easily uh, earn their place in the boat and should be you know, throwing a lot of the us male chauvinists off uh, to make room for them. I've seen a lot of gals that are really good sailors uh, over the years that never really got into offshore sailing because they thought it was a man's thing. It really isn't. I learned a good lesson early on. I remember I was in my, I think, early 20s doing a, an Orange Bowl regatta down in Florida. And uh, I remember a couple of young ladies were on a boat in the parking lot um, near us. And, um, and I said, oh, you know, there's at least one team we're going to be able to beat. And uh, it, I'm trying, it was um, uh, Drew Sauer and uh, who was crewing with her uh, those days. All I remember is they came up and slammed a lead bow on us up at the starting line. We got spit out the back so fast at the start of the first race. And I think they went on to go ahead and win the regatta. <laughs> Going down the bay in the middle of a squall, in the middle of the night at 2 o'clock in the morning, they were jibing and they wrapped the spinnaker around the head stay. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, it's blowing about 40 knots, and all these seasoned uh, sailors from this area are like, well, now what do we do? Not Mary. <laughs> she grabbed the knife, said, I'll go do it. And she went up the rig and cut the spinnaker away. While these other guys are like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Regardless of the challenges, time spent sailing offshore is special. And so are the memories. My sister had sailed transatlantic in 67 uh, from Bermuda to Copenhagen on Carina. She got an award for being the only lady on the race. She was 19. Um, she had gone to Bermuda determined to get herself on a boat. And uh, she went up to Dick Nye, the owner of Carina, the, uh, the yawl, the second Carina, and uh, made her case. He went to Irving Pratt, who was a buddy he sailed against and said, what do you think of this idea of taking this 19-year-old offshore? And Irving Pratt told him that a boat was no place for a woman. So Dick went back and got, brought my sister on board. We were completing a jibe and the lifeline broke. And all of a sudden from behind me, I heard my husband yell, man overboard. <laughs> and those are words you never want to hear. Uh, I was the spotter to, and as the gap increased at a high rate of speed between us and our crewmen, it was pretty scary. Every time he slid behind a wave, I was afraid we would never see him again. You wake up in the middle of the night and you realize that the boat is a kilter and something's not right, and then all of a sudden the boom comes across and you rush up on deck and make sure it hasn't taken the back stay out or something like that. But he was a real cool, great sailor. He had been in the Coast Guard. He took his sea boots off, emptied the water out of his sea boots, and used them as flotation. And he was just happy as a clam at high tide. Sailing our first race to Hawaii, we had what we call the face of God squall come through. I was on deck, and uh, it was the middle of the night. And you look behind you, and normally you see a squall by realizing that the stars have disappeared behind you in some area. This time, the stars were gone from horizon to horizon, 180 degrees. Our sailmaker would say to me, young lady, can you move to windward? Young lady, can you move to leeward? And 
Now he just yells at me like everybody else. So I know I've arrived as a, <laughs> a real crewman. In junior collegiate and even in Olympic competition, achieving gender equity has been a high priority for many years, and today, happily, this is a reality. Offshore sailing is the next frontier. We encourage more women to set their sights on heading offshore.